In February 2022, Russia initiated a conflict escalation with Ukraine that marked the largest assault on a European nation since the horrors of World War II. This marked the continuation of the Russo-Ukrainian War that had begun in 2014. The outcome was a catastrophic human toll, with thousands of civilians and military personnel dead by mid-2022. Russian forces controlled about a fifth of Ukraine's landmass. The situation resulted in the displacement and mass exodus of millions of Ukrainians, sparking the most significant refugee crisis in Europe since the 1940s. The conflict's environmental aftermath, frequently labeled as an ecocide, had global implications, instigating food shortages. Contrary to their preemptive denials of any invasion plans, Russian officials had amassed troops on Ukraine's borders. Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed a, a special military operation was necessary to back the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk republics, regional separatist forces that had been battling Ukraine since 2014. Putin's assertions included a baseless accusation of Ukrainian neo-Nazi governance. Oppressing Russian minorities, Putin defended his projected aim to purge Ukraine of its military and alleged fascist elements. The attack on Ukraine was two-pronged, aerial bombardment and ground offensive launched from Belarus aimed at Kiev, Crimea, and eastward towards Donbass and Kharkiv. Ukraine responded by imposing martial law and arranging general mobilization. Tactical difficulties and fierce Ukrainian defense forced Russian troops to withdraw from the northern front by April 2022. However, Russia successfully occupied Kyrgyzstan in March and Mariupol in May after inflicting severe damage. Continued bombing of both military and civilian establishments, even those distant from the front line, marked the winter months by the end of 2022. Ukrainian forces had managed to stage successful counterattacks in the south and east. Internationally, the invasion was met with rejection and reprisals. International bodies, including the United Nations and the International Court of Justice, condemned Russia's actions, with the latter ordering Russia to desist military operations. Sanctions were imposed on Russia and its ally, Belarus, by various nations. A global outcry against the conflict saw protests materialize worldwide, marked by numerous arrests of anti-war demonstrators in Russia. Over 1,000 organizations halted their operations in Russia and Belarus due to the conflict, and the International Criminal Court initiated investigations into possible human rights abuses, war crimes, the abduction of children, and potential genocide, subsequently issuing an arrest warrant for it. Putin and Maria Lvova, Blova, in March 2023. Putin contended in 1990 that NATO had assured Eastern European countries would not be integrated into their fold. A statement met with contention. This narrative thread started to unravel in 2013, when Kremlin advisor Sergei Glaziev stated Russia would not be able to maintain Ukraine's sovereignty should the country strike a designated deal with the European Union. As events unfolded, Ukraine's President Viktor Yanukovych reneged on the proposed association agreement with the UU, favoring a tighter alliance with the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union. This unexpected turn of events stimulated the Euromaidan protests, culminating in the February 2014 revolution of dignity that removed Yanukovych from power. Driving him into exile in Russia, this shift unleashed pro-Russian sentiment within the eastern and southern regions of ukraine Russian. Troops, lacking recognizable insignia, moved into Crimea, a territory of Ukraine, taking control of important positions, including the Crimean parliament. The disputed referendum of March 2014 resulted in the incorporation of Crimea into Russia. An armed conflict ensued in Donbass in April 2014 when Russian-backed separatists took over Ukrainian government structures, claiming the independence of Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. Attempts to cease the fighting with the Minsk agreements in 2014 and 2014 faltered repeatedly with ongoing contention over Russia's role in the dispute. After the annexation of Crimea and the inception of the war in Donbass, waves of Russian nationalism and fascism swept over Russia with demands to annex more Ukrainian territories for Novorossiya, New Russia. Analyst Vladimir Sokor described Putin's 2014 speech post, Nexation is advocating for ad greater Russia irredentism. As tensions peaked, questionable historical assertions from Putin emerged, claiming Russians and Ukrainians were indistinguishable as one people, and that Ukraine was a creation of Russian Bolsheviks lacking a genuine tradition of statehood. 
Experts, such as the American historian Timothy Snyder and the British journalist Edward Lucas, argued that these narratives represented imperialism and historical revisionism, respectively the increased Russian military presence at the Russia-Ukraine border in March, April 2021, and again in late 2021 to early 2022, heightened tensions Russian government officials continuously rebuffed claims of invading Ukraine, attributing the decision primarily to Putin and his close-knit advisors. Midst the ratcheting up of these tensions, Russia made untenable demands, seeking that NATO cease all activities in Eastern Europe and bar Ukraine and any former Soviet state from NATO membership, threatening a military response if ignored. These demands overlooked the reality that Eastern European nations had actively sought NATO involvement for protective measures against Russian territorial ambitions. In February 2022, amidst growing tensions, French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz both endeavored to prevent conflict. Despite Macron's meeting with Putin and Schultz's threat of heavy sanctions and proposal for Ukrainian neutrality, all efforts to dissuade Putin from the invasion proved futile doubts were circulated about Putin's ability to maintain adherence to any established agreements. On the 21st of February, Putin recognized the Russian-controlled territories of Ukraine, Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, as independent states. He subsequently deployed troops to these regions under the guise of peacekeepers and authorized military force abroad. In the early hours of February 24, Putin declared a special military operation, an implicit declaration of war against Ukraine. He made an array of false accusations against Ukraine, painting a narrative of victimization and propagating his intentions of demilitarization and denazification of the country. The Russian invasion kicked off on the 24th with missile strikes across the country and troop invasions from multiple fronts. This was the largest attack on a European nation since the Second World War and the largest combined arms operation since the Battle of Berlin in 1945. Amidst these unprecedented events, Ukrainian President Zelensky declared martial law in the country Russian intentions remained unclear, as there was no official declaration of war, and leaked FSB documents indicated they were unaware of Putin's invasion plan. The narrative chronicles the Russian military's advancement and setbacks during its invasion in Ukraine. Seizing Kherson by March 2, the Russian army encountered a severe ambush in Brovary on March 9, forcing them to retreat. Despite laying siege on the Western Front encompassing critical Ukrainian territories such as Chernihiv, Sumy, and Kharkiv, the Russian forces weren't able to seize these cities due to staunch opposition and operational hitches in Mykolaiv Oblast. While Russians advanced up to Vaznesinsk, they were compelled to retreat south of Mykolaiv. The Russian Defense Ministry announced the conclusion of their invasion's first stage on March 25. This initial stage transpired across four major fronts led by the Russian Eastern Military District towards western Kiev from Belarus the Central Military District aiming at Eastern Kyiv from Russia, the Western Military District towards Kharkiv, and a Southern Front heading towards Oja, and a Southern Front heading towards Ota and Mariupol from Crimea and Russia's Rostov Oblast. Strategic repositioning commenced on April 7 as Russian troops from the Northern Front pulled back from the Kyiv offensive to resupply and refocus their efforts on the Donbass region, while troops from the Northeast Front also withdrew to recess and regroup by April 26, representatives from the U.S. and its 40 allies gathered in Germany to formulate a strategy encompassing economic and military aid for Ukraine. Post-Russia's Victory Day in May, contrary views were predicted regarding Ukraine's fate. While some prophesied a territorial compromise for peace, others forecasted its determined resistance, backed by Russia's continual losses. By May 30, the disparity in artillery power was apparent, with Ukraine being significantly outclassed. However, President Putin, in response to President Biden's intent of supplying improved artillery to Ukraine, threatened to extend Russia's invasion to other Ukrainian cities subsequently. After a significant pause, Putin ordered a missile strike on Kyiv on June 6, presumably as a punitive measure. According to a news covered by BBC on 5th July, the devastating impact of Russia's invasion has left Ukraine to bear a tremendous financial burden. It is anticipated that the re-establishment of the war, torn Ukrainian economy, will be immensely challenging. Addressing a reconstruction conference held in Switzerland, Ukraine's Prime Minister Denis Shmyhal appealed to global nations, 
stating that a recovery plan would require a financial investment of $750 billion. Moreover, he urged Russian oligarchs to take responsibility and shoulder a part of the cost. The Russian invasion began on 24th February, with forces staging attacks from Belarus targeting the capital city, Kiev. The warfare expanded towards the northeastern city of Kharkiv and in the southeast towards Luhansk and Donetsk East. Towards Luhansk and Donetsk. With an apparent attempt to surround and capture Kiev, Russian forces initiated a spearhead attack along the Dnipro River from Belarus. Despite failed attempts to quickly capture Kiev, Russian forces persisted in their assault. The United States offered President Zelensky assistance to escape the country for the sake of his safety from potential kidnap or assassination attempts by the Russian military, however. Zelensky's refusal, insisting he needed ammunition, not protection, became an iconic quote of the invasion. By the start of March, Ukrainian defenses effectively limited Russia's advances along the Dnipro's west side. A substantial Russian fleet, reportedly stretching 64 kilometers, had made minimal progress toward Kiev. The Royal United Services Institute, a London-based think tank, interpreted Russian advances from the north and east to have stalled the advances did continue from the northwest, capturing various cities, although Irpin still remained a disputed area by the 9th of March. On 16th March, with Kiev proving challenging to conquer quickly, Russian forces shifted gears towards brutish bombing and siege warfare as Ukrainian forces launched a counter-offensive. The protracted war and the scope for reconstruction points to a grim future for Ukraine's economy, further underscoring the Prime Minister's plea for financial aid. The story focuses on the progression of an invasion spearheaded by Russian forces beginning 24th February. The Russian troops swiftly moved into Chernihiv Oblast, surrounding its administrative capital and successfully seizing Konotop. Parallel to this, they waged an assault on Sumy Oblast particularly targeting the city of Sumy near the border area. While they faced fierce resistance leading to stalled progress and heavy losses, they continued to assert their presence in areas like Okherka using thermobaric weaponry. Frederick Kagan highlighted on the 4th of March that the thrust towards Sumy illustrated a dangerous yet successful Russian approach towards Kiev, giving advantage to their mechanized units owing to the flat, scarcely populated terrain following which they made their way towards Brovari east of Kiev by the same date, however. It was Stanford on 6 April that confirmed their withdrawal from Chernihiv Oblast. Even though the situation in Sumy Oblast remained uncertain, the governor of Sumy Oblast on 7 April announced the vacating of Russian troops, but indicated a potential threat beneath the remaining explosives and other hazards. Meanwhile, on the 24th of February, Russian soldiers had taken control over the North Crimean Canal, and destroyed the dam that obstructed water supply to Crimea from the Dnieper since 2014. Interestingly, the attack turned towards the east, linking with the separatist-held Donbass and commencing the siege on Mariupol on 26 February. This is while naval units from Russia begun an assault near the Sea of Azov, setting up a beachhead that allowed for marine deployments northward. The movement wasn't just limited to the east. A Russian contingent from Crimea swept northwest, securing a bridge over the Dnieper. This was followed by an assault on Kyrgyzstan on 2nd March, which became the first significant city to fall to Russian forces. This victory paved the way for an assault on Mykolaiv, although the move was thwarted by Ukrainian forces. In response, the Ukrainians launched a counterstrike on the depot held Horlivka. Subsequently, Mariupol witnessed devastating missile attacks on 14th March, reporting over 2,500 casualties. By 18th March, Mariupol was surrounded and experienced intense fighting that compromised efforts to evacuate civilians. In a significant event on 20th March, a Russian bombing destroyed an art school providing refuge to around 400 people Russia demanded surrender. But the Ukrainians rebuffed their calls. As pointed out by Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Olha Stefanishina on 27 March, the city was largely decimated, with damage reaching upwards of 85%. Russian forces extended their campaign in the east, making active moves to take the city of Kharkiv located near the Russian border, but faced significant opposition from Ukrainian defenders. In a bold kaleidoscope of actions from both sides, the Ukrainian military mounted a successful missile attack on the Milorovo Air Base on February 25, causing the destruction of several Russian Air Force aircraft and igniting a fire. In the tense environment that followed, in March, the leader of the Donetsk People's Republic, DPR, 
Denis Pouchelin announced the near completion of a siege on the eastern city of Volnavaka by deeper forces. However, the tide seemed to swing when Russian forces were driven back from Siviero Donetsk during an assault. Despite these challenges, Russia reportedly secured control over Izium by mid-March. Though skirmishes continued, this spiral of events led the Russian Defense Ministry to declare on March 25 their intent to gain dominion over major cities in eastern Ukraine. A week later, the Ukrainian military confirmed that Izium was now under Russian control. According to a PB's news report, shelling and missile attacks on Kharkiv had renewed with a vengeance, ominously coinciding with peace talks with Russia in Istanbul. Following intensifying Russian bombardment of Kharkiv at the end of March, a Russian helicopter strike on an oil supply depot in Belgorod was reported, with Ukraine being accused, an allegation it strenuously denied. By April 7, the menacing congregation of Russian troops and tank divisions around certain towns in the east led to a government advisory for ruminant residents to evacuate, citing inadequate arms supply. As April progressed, Russian advances were slowed by robust Ukrainian resistance in Mariupol, particularly around the vast fortified Azovstal steel mill. On April 19, a renewed eastern assault was confirmed by the New York Times, with missile attacks on both Kiev and Lviv despite these developments. A NATO official expressed lukewarm assessment of Russia's progress and a U.S. defense official derided the Russian offensive as tepid and minimal. Moving into mid-year, it was announced that the Russian troops were divided into two commanding units, the army groups Center and South. In response to foreign military aid provided to Ukraine, Russia expanded its operations to the Zaporizhia and Kyrgyzstan region's Russian ground forces, started building volunteer battalions in the west in June 22, Italians in the west in June 2022, in preparation to strengthen their numbers at the front. Despite these measures, by September's counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast, the Russian retreat left behind significant military hardware and the newly formed Third Army Corps according to Forbes, having practically vanished with minimal impact on the battlefield. In the first week of May, Russian forces restarted their assault on the Azovstal steel factory after releasing around 100 Ukrainian civilians. Notably, Russia employed thermobaric bombs against the remaining Ukrainian troops isolated from their national government. Ukrainian President Zelensky consequently granted the commander at the embattled factory the authority to surrender under the escalating Russian assault, as reported by the Daily Telegraph on May 6. A sizable number of Ukrainian soldiers, close to 2,000, were encamped at the steel factory with 700 reported injuries after all. Civilians were evacuated by May 7, as stated by the Associated Press. These troops besieged for a military outlet for evacuation fearing a brutal end at the hands of the Russian forces if they gave up dissension among the Ukrainian forces, was reported on May 8 by Ukrainska Pravda. As per their reports, the leader of the Ukrainian Marine Defenses at Azovstal apparently procured tanks, ammunition, and personnel without sanction, leading to a breakout in flight. This weakened the Ukrainian defense and permitted the Russian troops to advance the remaining troops, then pronounced themselves as walking dead men further intensifying their resolve to fight. The Ukrainian general staff announced on May 16 that the Mariupol garrison had successfully executed its combat mission and initiated final evacuations from the steel factory. 264 service members were relocated to Olenivka under Russian control, and 53 seriously injured were hospitalized in Russian-held Novoazovsk. Post the Ukrainian forces' departure from Azovstal, the city of Mariupol came completely under the control of Russian and Depar forces, concluding the battle and the siege of Mariupol. Russian President Putin promised international standards of treatment for surrendering fighters, whilst the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, asserted his commitment to repatriating his troops despite some Russian lawmakers voicing their opposition to any prisoner exchange with the Azov regiment. Concurrently, a missile attack perpetrated by Russia on Kramatorsk railway station on April 8 reportedly resulted in at least 52 casualties and between 87 to 300 injured persons. Ukrainian President Zelensky on April 11 warned of an impending heavy Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. U.S. officials highlighted Russia's retraction and reallocation efforts in southeast Ukraine. Satellite images on April 11 showed vast Russian infantry and mechanized convoys moving southwards from Kharkiv to Izium, indicative of their covert plans to redeploy northeastern forces to the southeastern invasion front.
By June 2nd, it was reported by the Washington Post that Sivier Odonetsk was on the verge of surrender to Russian forces, with over four-fifths of the city captured. However, on June 3rd, Ukrainian forces initiated a counter-offensive. Government reports on June 4th suggested that they had managed to regain control of a fifth of the city. On June 12th, reports emerged showing as possibly as many as 800 Ukrainian non-combatants, according to Ukrainian reports, and between 300 and 400 soldiers. According to Russian soldiers, according to Russian sources, were under siege at the Azot chemical plant in Severodonetsk. As the city's defenses waned, a renewed Russian offensive targeted the adjacent city of Lysykansk. By June 20th, Russian forces had consolidated control over Severodonetsk by capturing surrounding villages, including Metalkine. Chan on June 24th reported that as Russian forces continued their advance with a scorched earth policy, Ukraine's military was ordered to retreat from Severodonetsk, leaving several civilians stranded at the Azot chemical plant. Their predicament was likened to that of civilians trapped at the civilians trapped at the Azovstal Steel Works in Mariupol in May. Lysykansk, too, fell to the Russian invasion by July 3rd, with CBS reporting that the Russian Defense Ministry announced it was now under their control. The Guardian claimed that after the Luhansk region was captured, Russian forces would push into neighboring Donetsk to target Slobyansk and Bakhmut. On April 14, it was reported that a bridge between Kharkiv and Izium was blown up by Ukrainian forces, stalling the Russian convoy. According to Forbes, by May 5th, Ukraine had stationed its 4th and 17th tank brigades and the 95th Air Assault Brigade around Izium, while the 92nd and 93rd Mechanized Brigades were placed around Kharkiv. These forces appeared prepared for rear guard action against the Russian forces appeared prepared for rear guard action against the Russian forces. Reports from BBC on May 13 suggested that Russian forces in Kharkiv were being redeployed following advances by Ukrainian troops in the region and the city. This included Ukrainian troops destroying strategic pontoon bridges, previously used by Russian troops for quick tank deployment in the region. Let's discuss the persistent missile attacks by Russia on Ukraine, particularly targeting the key cities of Odessa, Dnipro, and Zaporizhia. Beginning on April 24, Russia initiated a series of escalatory missile blasts on Odessa. Devastating military stations and inflicting civilian casualties, Ukrainian sources claimed that two Russian broadcast towers in Transnistria, which primarily propagated Russian television programming, were annihilated on April 27. Concurrently, Russian missiles ravaged runways in Odessa, followed closely by Ukrainian troops working to remove Russian forces from Snake Island, located 200 kilometers from Odessa. Despite the vociferous global condemnation of a Russian missile strike on the Ukrainian port of Odessa, the onslaught persisted, facilitated by the shelling and bombing intensities in Mykolaiv as reported by Senyan July 31. This event resulted in the demise of Ukrainian grain tycoon Alexei Vatatorskia, alongside several others. The Russian forces maintained their aggressive approach, with missile attacks and bombings on key metropolitan areas, including the destruction of Dnipro International Airport on April 10. Multiple reports have detailed the devastating impacts of these assaults, leading to the displacement of several people from the besieged city of Mariupol. The story also focuses on the alarming status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, termed as extremely tense by the Ukrainian nuclear agency, Energoatom. With about 500 Russian soldiers controlling the plant and utilizing its vicinity for storing weaponry, it led to a nationwide air raid alert despite international intervention. Access to the power plant remained severely restricted as of July 2023. This chronic series of Russian missile onslaughts has led to reactive measures from the international community, with global leaders labeling these acts as war crimes. In a concurrent development, threats of deliberate damage to the Zaporizhia nuclear plant have met with strict warnings from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, stating that any radiation leaks attributable to the assault would invoke Article 5 equating the attack to an aggression against all NATO member countries. On the 26th of August, power was restored as one reactor was brought back online in the afternoon and another in the evening. The International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, led by Rafael Grossi, investigated the plant on the 29th of August. The team, which included Liddy Everard and Massimo Aparo, found no leaks were reported prior to their arrival, despite the plant being shelled a few days earlier. The story then takes a dramatic turn on the 6th of September, 2022, 
when Ukraine initiated an unexpected counteroffensive in the Kharkiv region. Led by the formidable General Sersky, this move caught Moscow off guard, forcing them to concede key territories and diminishing the perceived invincibility of President Putin. Not to be deterred, Putin launched a partial mobilization on the 21st of September, with Defense Minister Sergei Shuik announcing 300,000 reservists would be brought into play and vowing to use all means to defend itself. In response to Moscow's intensifying actions, the British Foreign Office Minister Gillian Keegan referred to it as an escalation, and Sakia el Dorje, the former president of Mongolia, accused Russia of using Russian Mongols as disposable assets. As September ended, controversial referendums were held across Russian-occupied Ukraine, leading to the annexation of Donetsk, Kharkiv, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia. The results were vehemently denounced as fraudulent by Ukraine and its allies. On the 6th and 11th of September, the IAA reported that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant had sustained damages and security risks from outside attacks and the presence of occupying forces. By the early hours of the 9th of October, a Russian airstrike claimed 13 civilian lives in Zaporizhia and injured 89. The harrowing sequence of events underscores the brutality and human cost of the conflict. In October, the Ukrainian military advanced towards the southern city of Kyrgyzstan, claiming over 1170 square kilometers of territory. The defense minister of Russia on 9th November gave orders for Russian troops to withdraw from parts of Kyrgyzstan Oblast, displacing towards the east of Dnieper by 11th November. Ukrainian forces stepped foot into Kyrgyzstan, marking the withdrawal of Russia and the end of their stronghold on the end of their stronghold on the western side of the Dnieper. The Ukrainian forces, under the command of General Sersky, surprised the opponents with yet another counteroffensive on 6th September in the Kharkiv region. Leading with the push, the Ukrainian forces made a notable advancement into the Russian terrain, claiming back approximately 400 square kilometers of land's advancement, according to Russian voices may have been prompted by the Russian shift of forces to Kherson following the offensive off Ukraine. On 8th September, the Ukrainian forces seized Balaklia, coming within approximation of 15 kilometers to Kupiansky. Military analysts suggested the Ukrainian forces were advancing towards this key railway hub, with an intent to disconnect the Russian forces in Azion. The Russian administration of Kharkiv Oblast on 9th September declared an intended evacuation of civilians from Azium, Kupiansk, and Velikiansk in Velikiai, Berluk. The ISW conjectured Kupiansk's subsequent fall within the impending 72 hours, along with the dispatch of Russian reserve units to the area. On 10th September, Ukraine's seizure of nearly 2,500 square kilometers of land was marked by the flying of the Ukrainian flag in Kupiansk. Soon thereafter, Russian forces drew back from their northeastern Ukraine positions. Compelled by the Ukrainian offensive, it's worth noting that it forced the Russian forces to leave their stronghold of Izium due to the seizure of Kupiansk. By 15 September, the UK's Ministry of Defense confirmed Russia's loss or withdrawal from majority of its positions west of the Oskol River and leaving behind numerous high-value military assets. The Ukrainian offensive pressed on liberating another key city in the Second Battle of Lyman by October 2nd. The period between November 12, 2022 and June 7, 2023, witnessed a winter stalemate, a campaign of attrition, and a military surge. In the protracted conflict, the Russian private military firm Wagner Group began to gain more significantly. It led aggressive offensives in Bakhmut, with vast number of soldiers drafted from prison battalions embarking on perilous attacks on Ukrainian positions. Towards the end of January 2023, dramatic escalations of the conflict were seen in the southern Zaporizhia region, region resulting in heavy losses on both sides. The scene was duplicated in southern parts of Donetsk Oblast, where the Russian army's intense offensive near the coal mining precinct of Ulitor witnessed the largest tank confrontation in the war. Up till then, the outcome was catastrophic for the Russian contingent, losing a huge number of tanks and armored personnel carriers, according to Ukrainian commanders. This led to the British Defense Ministry remarking that an entire Russian brigade was effectively wiped out. Following a defeat in Kyrgyzstan and Kharkiv, Russian and Wagner forces shifted their focus to Bakhmut, intending to break the extended stalemate that had lasted for half a year. They attempted to isolate the city, launching an assault from Solidar in the north after sustaining severe losses. They eventually gained control of Solidar on January 16, 2023. 
By early February, Bakhmut was surrounded by attacks from all sides except the West, where Ukrainian supply lines were in operation through Chasivyar. On March 3, Ukrainian soldiers demolished two major bridges, potentially enabling a strategic retreat from eastern sectors of Bakhmut. The following day, reports emerged of street battles taking place in the city. Despite Bakhmut's near total encirclement, Ukrainian officers on March 7 were still requesting permission from Kiev to continue battle against the Russians. On March 26, Wagner Group declared complete control of the strategically important Azom factory in Bakhmut. Three days later, General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, addressed the House Committee on Armed Services, stating that Russian forces had made no headway in and around Bakhmut. For the past 20 or so days, he referred to the heavy toll inflicted on Russian soldiers in the area as total carnage. By May, the SE's assessment revealed that Ukrainians had control of less than five of the city. However, on May 18, 2023, the New York Times reported that Ukrainian forces had initiated a counteroffensive, recapturing significant territories in the north and south of Bechmut over a few days. Into the second half of 2023, a fresh round of offensives commenced on June 8 right through to December 1, marking yet another phase of the intense war. On June 24, a sudden uprising occurred against the Russian government, led by the armed group known as the Wagner Group. They managed to seize multiple Western Russian cities with limited resistance before moving on to the capital, Moscow. This could be seen as the climax of a long-standing feud and quest for power between Wagner and the Russian Ministry of Defense. Within a day, the rebellion was quelled under an agreement whereby the troops leader Yevgeny Prigushin was to be exiled to Belarus and the forces would receive immunity from legal charges. By June 27, reports from the UK Ministry of Defense suggested that Ukraine had likely regained control over areas in the eastern Donbass region, previously occupied by Russia since 2014. It was further claimed that the Ukrainian military had even advanced into the southern Kyrgyzstan region, securing a position along the Dnipro River's left bank. Come August, a report by The Guardian revealed that Ukraine had become the world's most heavily mined country with Russia allegedly planning millions of mines to hinder Ukraine's military push. This vast swath of minefields necessitated an intensive demining operation by Ukraine for further advancement. Stretching their men and resources thin each square meter was allegedly found to contain five mines in some regions. The conflict heightened at the Black Sea following Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative, with Ukraine intensifying attacks on Russian vessels. One such incident on August 4 witnessed a Russian landing ship, Olenogorsky Gornyak, taking damage from an unmanned naval drone, according to Ukrainian intelligence video proof, was also released showing the ship apparently tilting. By mid-September, it was reported by both Russian and Ukrainian sources that Russian naval assets in Sevastopol had sustained damage, including two military ships, one possibly being a submarine, Ukraine also reported regaining several oil and gas drilling platforms in the Black Sea, previously under Russian control since 2015. As per Ukrainian intelligence, by September 2023, Russia had purportedly deployed over 420,000 troops within Ukrainian territory. The intensity of the conflict escalated dramatically on September 21, with Russia launching missile attacks across Ukraine, hitting energy facilities subsequently on September 22, the U.S. announced its decision to supply long-range attacks missiles to Ukraine despite internal dissension. In a retaliatory move that day, Ukrainian intelligence launched a missile strike on the Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Sevastopol, Crimea, claiming the lives of several high-ranking military officers. In the high-stakes realm of international security, November 2023 saw the hospitalization of the wife of Ukraine's head of security service due to heavy metals poisoning. The Ukrainians cast suspicion on the Russian Federal Security Service, FSB, who have reportedly made numerous assassination attempts on the security service chief. President Volodymyr Zelensky admitted in December that year that Ukrainian counteroffensives had unfortunately fallen short of their targets due to a deficit in weaponry and ground forces, a sobering reality. According to Zelensky, the task of reclaiming the heavily militarized Donbass region in the east, where pro-Russian sentiments often aflame, would be far more challenging than regaining the Crimean Peninsula. The international press, too, met these military efforts with skepticism, as Ukraine seemed unable to reclaim significant territories or reach their strategic goals. 
That same month, Ukraine's Armed Forces Commander-in-Chief Valery Zaluznyai revealed findings of a covert listening device in his office and hinted at similar bugs found elsewhere. This discovery followed a local media release about a bug found in a room used by the security service during routine sweeps. On 26 December, Ukraine's Air Force used air-launched cruise missiles to attack the Russian landing ship Novocherkaskas. Docked in Crimea's southern region, Feodosia the powerful attack ignited a series of explosions, wreaked havoc on the ship, and cast a major blow to Russia's seaborne capabilities. Meanwhile, at the helm of state affairs stood Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Ukrainian counterpart Zelensky. Putin, known for his hands, on approach, was reported to have bypassed senior commanders and given direct orders to brigade commander. Against this backdrop, US General Mark Milley praised Ukraine's command and chief of the armed forces, General Valeriy Zaluzhnyi, for his impressive leadership during the war. The lack of an overall commander during the onset of Russia's invasion led to a diffusion of responsibilities among Russian military district commanders. After a series of initial failures, Alexander Dvornikov of the Southern Military District was given overall command, which brought a degree of focus to the Russian offensives, however. Moscow's dissatisfaction with on-ground performance resulted in a cycles of leadership changes despite that. Massive setbacks. Russia's invasion was not without a heavy cost. Notably, the loss of a considerable number of its officers, including 12 generals. In a series of events spanning over several months, Ukraine reportedly deployed drones to conduct devastating strikes on Russian airbases, leading to the destruction of numerous aircrafts and severe casualties. Reports suggest that the drone attacks also disrupted the Russian Navy Day celebrations due to civilian injuries the western Crimean Saki airbase was the site of significant detonations, resulting in severe damage to several aircraft. Initial suspicion fell upon long-range missiles, sabotage, or an accidental explosion Ukrainian General Valery Zaluzhnyi would eventually take responsibility for this armed action. Traffic congestion spiraled in the aftermath, with frantic civilians attempting to flee the region. The subsequent weeks saw Russia accusing saboteurs of further explosions and a fire at an armed storage near Dzonkoy in northeastern Crimea. Approximately 2,000 individuals were successfully evacuated from this volatile area. Further detonations would later be reported at the Sevastopol Northern Belbek Air Base. In a significant event on 8 October 2022, the Kerch Bridge, Crimea's significant link to Russia, partially collapsed following an explosion. Tragically, there would be a repeat of this large-scale explosion in July 2023. Russia simultaneously executed several campaigns against Ukraine's water and electricity infrastructure, causing extensive blackouts in Kiev and its peripheries. Emphasizing the importance of this war, Putin, in his New Year's address, declared it as a, a sacred duty to their ancestors, even as Ukraine remained under relentless missile and drone attacks. In further developments, the New York Times reports that Russia utilized advanced hypersonic missiles in a grand-scale attack on Ukraine, a capability far superior in eluding Ukraine's customary anti-missile defenses. Ukraine's strategic location on the Black Sea allows access to open waters through Turkish, held straits which were closed on 28 February under the Montreux Convention of 1936, blocking access to non-registered Russian warships. On 24th February, Snake Island was under attack by Russian naval vessels, leading to a bold response from Ukrainian forces posted there. Russian forces eventually managed to gain control of the island post-bombardment. The series of events clearly demonstrates escalating tensions in the volatile environment within the region, with no immediate resolution in sight. Ukraine imposed a maritime exclusion zone of almost five miles wide towards the southeast part of its territory closing its ports at the highest security level and laying sea mines in its ports in order to halt any potential threat. However, on 13 April, the Russian cruiser Moskva, the Black Sea Fleet's flagship, was reportedly set ablaze following an attack by two Ukrainian Neptune missiles. Following this, the Russian Defense Ministry announced that the crew had been safely evacuated and that the warship had suffered major damage from a fire triggering an ammunition explosion. Ire triggering an ammunition explosion. Despite this, the ship was found moving east for repairs based in Sevastopol, however. By the end of the day, the ministry revealed that the Moskva had sank due to adverse weather conditions. In response, Russia launched an attack on the Kiev missile factory where the Neptune missiles were produced by early May. Ukraine had launched counterattacks on Snake Island, and it was revealed that the U.S. 
had provided intelligence to assist in sinking of the Moskva. Despite the Russian Defense Ministry's claims of repelling these counterattacks, Ukraine released footage of one of Russia's landing crafts being destroyed near Snake Island. On 1st June, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov blamed Ukraine's policy of blocking its own harbors to deter Russian maritime invasion for the food export crisis on 30th June 2022. Russia announced the withdrawal of its troops from the island as a peace offering. In the wake of the invasion, President Putin put and put Russia's nuclear forces on high alert, sparking concern of a potential nuclear attack against Ukraine. Putin and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov both made ominous references to nuclear weapon usage, raising fears of a possible World War IIEIC. A director William Burns expressed concern of a potentially desperate Putin employing nuclear means in the event of defeat. In response to Russia's disregard for safety protocols during its occupation of the disabled former Chernobyl, and when launching missiles near the active Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Ukraine Zelensky called for a dialogue on Russia's use of nuclear resources, emphasizing the global security resources, emphasizing the global security risk they pose. The story demonstrates Ukrainian defiance against ongoing Russian subjugation. Ukrainian citizens propelled by patriotism, courageously opposing the invaders through multiple avenues. The spontaneous volunteerism for territorial defense, homemade Molotov cocktails, food donations, and removal or alteration of road signs are clear illustrations of their spirit for national preservation. Additionally, civilians facilitated refugee transport and built various obstructions, including Zhik hedgehogs, to impede military advances. Street protests erupted frequently, evolving into verbal disagreements and physical confrontations with occupying Russian troops, as shown by social media reports. By April, a more organized guerrilla approach emerged among the civilians. Particularly in the country's north and east woodlands, the official Ukrainian military enhanced its defensive strategy and announced plans for a large-scale guerrilla operation. The unarmed civilian population resorted to direct physical blockages of Russian military vehicles, sometimes successfully prompting retreat. Russian forces varied in their response to this nonviolent show of resistance. From reluctance in aerial firing to direct shooting into crowds, mass detentions, and reported human rights abuses, including forced disappearance, mock executions, hostage, taking extrajudicial murdering, and sexual violence. Ukrainian civilians found innovative ways to aid their military, including using technology like Telegram chatbots and the government app DAI to report Russian military positions. Anticipating this, Russians sought to disable the mobile network, confiscating smartphones and computers, and reportedly killed a civilian found in possession of pictures of Russian tank. Ukrainian President Zelensky announced in May a standing army of 700,000 active duty members, and Ukraine began the process of recalling its deployed soldiers and weapons from UN peacekeeping mission. The international community echoed their support through widespread condemnation of the invasion. Ungeneral assembly resolutions, new sanctions on Russia, and cancellation of nuclear cooperation by most European countries are clear indicators. Despite Russia shifting its energy exports and adjusting its economy, it had to endure widespread economic impact, both domestically and globally. Global humanitarian and military aid reached Ukraine from over 70 countries in the EU. Forced to comply with economic sanctions, Russia faced a new airspace closure, restriction from swift payment system, and media outlet bans. Public, media, and legal reactions have continued to reverberate globally with ongoing peace efforts playing a crucial role in this narrative. As of October 2022, Russia has been designated a terrorist state by three countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. In response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Iceland became the first European nation to close its Russian embassy on 1st August. The incident led to Ukraine, Finland, and Sweden applying for NATO membership, with Finland becoming a member in April 2023. A report from the Kiel Institute revealed that between 24th January 2022 24th February 2023, Ukraine received $155, 9 cents billion in various forms of aid from 41 countries and European Union institutions. Additionally, NATO coordinates and assists its member states in providing billions of dollars worth of military equipment and financial aid to Ukraine. The United States ranks first in providing military assistance, committing more than $29, 3 cents billion from 24th February 2022 to 3rd February 2023. Three, several NATO allies, including Germany, 
altered previous stances against providing offensive military support to aid Ukraine. The U also broke precedent by supplying lethal arms and providing Year 3. One billion to Ukraine for the first time in its history, Bulgaria, a significant producer of Soviet pattern arms, has secretly supplied over Year 2 billion worth of weapons and ammunition to Ukraine. Bulgaria also contributes to the Ukrainian armed forces' fuel needs, supplying up to 40 at certain times. Military aid, sanctions, and international outcry characterize the global community's response to the Ukrainian invasion. While the U.S. has adopted a policy of non-deployment in Ukraine, several countries enacted sanctions aimed at destabilizing Russia's economy. Meanwhile, Belarus has permitted Russia to use its territory as a staging ground for the invasion, including missile launches into Ukraine. In March 2023, Politico reported that Chinese weapon manufacturer Norinco delivered assault rifles, drone parts, and body armor to Russia from June to December 2022 utilizing Turkey and the United Arab Emirates as transit points. The U.S. reports suggest that Chinese ammunition has been deployed on Ukrainian battlefields in May 2023. The U. identified Chinese and UIE firms as suppliers of weapon components to Russia. U.S. military intelligence indicated in June 2023 that Iran was providing Russia with UAV production material. Following a disagreement over grain between Poland and Ukraine, Poland announced on 21st September 2023 that it would cease arms shipment to Ukraine. A spotlight has been cast on the haunting echo of war crimes committed by Russia, striking a bitter resemblance to the historical specter of Soviet-imposed famine, the Holodomor, that remains etched into Ukraine's collective memory. Reports of vehement attacks on everyday places like marketplaces and bread queues, as well as strategic destruction of infrastructure of infrastructure of exports, exemplify the scale of the crises. In addition, forcible deportation of civilians like those from Mariupol has ignited international awareness. Given that this act is flagged as a war crime and a crime against humanity, as per Geneva Convention, Protocol II and Article 8 and 7 of the Rome Statute, respectively, Yet, attempts to ascertain the reality are often hindered by both Russian and Ukrainian sources as they allegedly inflate the casualties of opposition while reducing their own for purposes of morale. This is further confirmed by leaked U.S. documents that reveal a reluctance within the Russian system to relay adverse updates up the hierarchy, resulting in under-reporting of casualties civilian and military casualties have always been tricky to pin down exactly. Claims of staggering losses and enemy defeats by both parties remain largely unverified by independent agencies, such as Agents France. Press, F, thus raising suspicions of exaggeration. It's not just military casualties that are difficult to estimate, but civilian deaths as well. In June 2022, Ukraine's defense minister suggested tens of thousands of Ukrainians may have been killed. The situation in the war-ravaged city of Mariupol is particularly grim with estimated civilian death tolls ranging from 10,000 to 75,000. A chilling revelation made by the city's mayor adds another horrid layer to the narrative. Russian invaders allegedly brought along mobile cremation equipment. Overall, the war-related casualties from both sides are believed to be higher than currently reported, as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights cites key data gaps due to the paucity of information from Russian-occupied territories. Focusing on the thematic backdrop of a massive humanitarian crisis amidst warfare, the narrative discusses the severe consequences of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which started in March 2022. Troops and civilian sailors from both sides were traded in a series of prisoner exchanges, the numbers of which shifted widely, as indicated by intelligence data. Significantly, Yale's humanitarian research lab drew attention to filtration camps near Donetsk, including evidence of potential grave sites. These camps, one of which is identified as Olenivka Prison, housed civilians, POWs, and other personnel under dire conditions. Keva Koshnud, a Yale professor, emphasized the severe threat posed to public health by such detention facilities, condemning the harsh treatment meted out. Data from official figures including Volker Turk, UN Human Rights Commissioner, added to the grim picture by explaining the cruel treatment of Ukrainian POWs, from welcoming beatings upon arrival to ongoing torture and detention. Also, disturbing videos surfaced, depicting brutal acts such as beheadings by alleged Russian soldiers, an act that stirred international outrage and led to inquiries by Russian officials. The wide-reaching, devastating consequences of this conflict extended to the significant damage to Ukraine's rich cultural heritage. 
Ukraine's Minister of Culture labeled this destruction a form of cultural genocide, implicating the deliberate ruin and plundering of heritage sites as war crimes further. The staggering number of internal displacements and refugees made this an international crisis. The narrative takes a sobering turn as the atrocities committed on civilians and resulting mass casualties and displacement were labeled as genocide and democide. A one-back investigation further pointed out grotesque tortures, some leading to death, as well as sexual assaults committed by the occupying Russian forces. A damning report by Physicians for Human Rights underlined the systematic targeting of Ukraine's healthcare infrastructure with egregious attacks documented in 2022 alone, amounting to war crimes. The obliteration of the health system became a pertinent factor in the Russian conduct during this grim war. By May 3rd, a staggering 8 million individuals had become internally displaced within Ukraine. The majority of these forced migrants were women, children, the elderly, and the disabled due to the forcible conscription of Ukrainian men aged 18 to 60, excluding those financially supporting three or more children, single fathers and parents, or guardians of children with disabilities despite this, many Ukrainian men and young adults voluntarily chose to stay and join resistance forces. Statistics from the UN High Commission for Refugees as of May 13, 2022, revealed an alarming number of refugees settled in various countries. Over 3 million in Poland, 901,696 in Romania, 594,664 in Hungary, 4,664 in Hungary, 460, 1,700 figure for Ukrainian refugees exceeded 800,104. The influx of Ukrainian refugees into the Zhik Republic by mid-July 2022 amounted to over 390,000, predominantly comprised of mothers with a single child who held higher levels of education relative to the native Czech population. Turkey emerged as another significant refuge, with more than 58,000 Ukrainian refugees registered by March 22nd, and an equivalent number by April 25th. In response to the crisis, the U enacted the Temporary Protection Directive for the first time, permitting Ukrainian refugees to reside and work in the U4 up to three years Britain accepted 146,379 refugees, granting them a similar extension of stay, including access to state services and welfare. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSKI, accused Russia of massive deportation involving over 1.3 million Ukrainian civilians, which could potentially amount to crimes against humanity. Both the OC and Ukraine associated Russia with forcibly moving civilians into filtration camps across Russian territories and Russia itself. These reports evoke echoes of Soviet-era population transfers and Russian conduct during the Chechen War of Independence. Notably, Russia stated that it had transferred about 120, 1,000 Mariupol residents to Russia by April 8th, and forcibly deported 60,000 civilians from the conflict zone in Kyrgyzstan Oblast on October 19th. Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council Secretary Oleksiy Danilov alleged that Russia intended to establish concentration camps for Ukrainians in western Siberia, likely to force prisoners into city construction in the region. The narrative focuses on the severe population decline and environmental damage as a result of the war with a significant portion highlighting the immigration of Russia's civilian population contributing to a brain drain. In this grim future of 2040, the population shrinks by roughly 20 to 35 million compared to pre-war numbers of 428 million. The greatest impact is perceived in the working age populace, a scenario drawn from various study projections ranging from optimistic to pessimistic war in predictions. An alarming trend of flight, prevalent in the southern and eastern regions and exhibiting a marked preference in educated women of childbearing age and their children, creates an adverse ripple effect. The author, Marina Teverdostup, asserts that an estimated 20 or more of the refugees may not return, a situation that will exacerbate the population shortage and hamper reconstruction efforts. From February 2022, Russian immigration became a major issue, fueled by factors including war mobilization, the numbers possibly ranged from 370,000 to over 820,000, cutting off a significant portion of the nation's working age, males. Experts argue that this demographic shift will persist beyond the conflict, and Putin's tenure those who left include savvy professionals across various fields, the younger, wealthier, and more educated, often sharing Western liberal values. The exodus of skilled human capital, sometimes called brain drain, 
out of Russia may have a significant effect on the course of the war and the Russian economy in the long run, posits Johannes Weich. With only an estimated 15 repatriation rate among those who left, the situation paints a grim picture in an attempt to mitigate the crisis. Putin, during the 2023 World Russian People's Council, called for women to have eight or more children. The war's environmental toll on Ukraine is staggering. Preliminary figures point to damages amounting to us to UE 51 billion. The Yale School of the Environment highlights the destruction of petrochemicals due to shelling and leaked pollutants contaminating bodies of water and soil, and a huge portion of Ukraine's land is littered with explosives and damaged forests. The Pax Peace Organization points the blame at Russia for the deliberate targeting of industrial and energy infrastructure causing severe pollution. The destruction of explosive weapons left millions of tons of contaminated debris in cities and towns. The damage to the Kakhovka Dam caused flooding and warnings of a potential ecological disaster. Intense peace deliberations between Russia and Ukraine unfolded between 28 February and 14 March 2022 across various locations, including the Gommel region on the Belarus, Ukraine border, and Turkey. The narrative evolved when on 13 July, Dmytro Kuleba, Ukraine's foreign minister asserted that the peace talks were at a standstill and the retrieval of Ukraine's eastern territories was a precondition to the continuation of the dialogue. A distinctly opposing sentiment was voiced by Dmitry Medvedev, the ex-president of Russia and the incumbent deputy head of the Russian Security Council, on 19 July, asserting that Russia would ascertain peace only in alignment with its terms. Parallelly, Russia's stand remained firm, as expressed by Russian dignitaries Dmitry Peskov and Sergei Lavrov, on the stipulation that Ukraine acknowledged Russia's sovereignty over the territories annexed in September 2020. He was a cornerstone for any peace proposal. As the year of tension filled diplomacy concluded, the prospect of Ukrainian peace dialogues with Russia appeared increasingly bleak following Russia's assertive stance that Ukraine's occupation would persist without negotiations. Amidst these circumstances, Ukrainian President Zelensky publicly declined to participate in peace talks with Russia under the current regime, practically banning such discussions. As 2023 dawned, Peskov, Putin's spokesperson, commented on a grim future for a diplomatic resolution to the Ukraine crisis. Antonio Guterres, Unsecretary General, echoed similar sentiments in May 2023 citing the engulfment of Russia and Ukraine in the war and their equal conviction in achieving victory. In June 2023, Alexei Reznikov, Ukrainian defense minister, criticized peace proposals presented by China, Brazil, and Indonesia as biased towards Russia. While Ukraine was amenable to China's mediation, the precondition was Russia's withdrawal from the territories that occupied this. It occupied this underlines the intricate diplomatic dance of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war.